something important to say, and I want you to listen. Do you know that there's a man who lives in your town, on your block, next door? Do you know that he is a teacher? He's using your public school system to indoctrinate your children with commie propaganda. And if you don't believe me, ask him, because he lives on your block at 2437 Sunny Glade Drive. And his name is Walter McTell. You're a liar! Neighbors, I have something important to say, and I want you to listen. Do you know that there is a man who lives in your town on your block? Next door. Do you know that... You're dirty right, you liar! And he's using your public school system to indoctrinate your children with common propaganda. And he has stated that he'll continue to teach our kids as he sees fit. Bobby! Continue until he's brainwashed. You're a liar! You're a dirty rotten liar! Bobby. It's not Georgia! Ask him, because he lives on your block at 2437 Sunny Glade Drive. His name is Walter McTenn. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to an all-new episode of the Chronic Rift Podcast. It's your old pal, John S. Drew, here, and it's Sunday morning, March 25th, 2018. Almost forgot the day there a moment. (sighs) It's almost the end of March. It's springtime. The snow is melting. I'm in a great mood. I'm also in, as I take a sip from my $6 million man travel mug, I'm in a classic TV mood. Today, I'm going to be talking with Chuck Harder. Chuck is the author of Mr. Novak, an acclaimed television series, and we're spending this hour together talking about what it has taken to get Mr. Novak the attention of Warner Brothers as well, because first season of this acclaimed television series about the realistic portrayal of high school life will premiere sometime here in 2018. We don't have a solid date yet, but... It is coming. So I want to get right into it here. Here is my talk recorded earlier this week with Mr. Chuck Harder. Mr. Novak was an American television show that ran from 1963 to 1965 on NBC. Each season depicted a year in the life of a high school English teacher portrayed by James Franciscus, who was teaching for the first time. Now, while many of us remember Room 222, It was Mr. Novak that was actually the first honest depiction of high school academia on television. Despite its short run, the series garnered a number of awards, including four Emmy nominations and the prestigious Peabody Award. Chuck Harder is the author of Mr. Novak, an acclaimed television series from Bear Manor Media. The work offers an extensive look at the development, production, and appeal of the series, supplemented by interviews with many people involved in the series. Chuck Harder, welcome to the Chronic Rift. And welcome, John. It's nice to be here and discuss uh, going back to high school. Now, that's one thing. You know, there's definitely themes and ideas that we see in this show that is relevant even today. Well, I would hope so. Uh, Although it's 50 years old, and we'll get into it, um, many of the themes of the show are still universal. And other than maybe the hairstyles of the kids, or they say cool instead of awesome or whatever, uh, it is very non-dated. And that's remarkable in a show 50 years old. Okay, now, considering your background in music and your previous projects with, like, the Monkees and something near and dear to my heart, the Superboy and Super Pup pilots of the 1960s, how did you come to write this book? Well, uh, it, it's remarkable, John, how things can turn on a dime. Um, when the show aired originally, I was a little kid, 
and we were a one television set family, as many people were. Now, Mr. Novak was opposite Combat, which was the war series with Vic Morrow. My dad being Air Force, well, you can guess which one we watched. So I was aware of it because James Franciscus was such a good-looking guy, he was uh, strangely a teen idol. He would be in 16 Magazine or Tiger Beat along with Paul McCartney and Herman and all that kind of stuff. So the little girls would be bringing into uh, the class the teen mags with a handsome blonde guy. So I at least knew who, you know, who he was. So the years went by, and the show unfortunately never re-ran, and we'll talk about that later, uh, and disappeared. So occasionally in a book on the history of TV, I would see Mr. Novak, a great dramatic show with James Franciscus and Dean Jagger, won awards. And that's about it, with maybe a picture of the two of them. Now, in the late 80s, the show briefly re-ran at 3 o'clock in the morning on Turner Network Television. We'll talk about that, too. I had no idea of it. So about three and a half years ago, a friend in New York sent me a stack of music DVDs, and in the pile was a stack marked Mr. Novak. Mr. Novak? What, what's Mr. Novak? So I called Bruce in New York. I said, Bruce, thanks, but what's Mr. Novak? Oh, well, I know you like 60s music. This is that old 60s teacher show. Oh, yeah, that's right. So I thought, well, I don't want to watch this. It's going to be corny and dated, and I didn't even ask for these. So I set them aside. And about three and a half weeks later, I was about to pack them away, and I thought, well, you know what? I ought to at least watch one. I mean, it was a gift, you know, to be cool. So I watched the pilot. And John, halfway through the pilot, I went, wait a minute. This is really good. At the end of the pilot... Wow, this show is great. Great writing, production, scripting, acting, and everything. And there was a second episode on there called The Risk, which is about a former alcoholic teacher. That was even better. So when they both ended, I said, you know, I'm pretty knowledgeable on TV history. I, why don't I know about this? This show is excellent. This is one of the greatest shows ever done. So I went to try and buy a book on the, the Internet. No book. So I tried to get a biography of James Franciscus. No biography in James Franciscus. What? So I found a website by a teacher who's still teaching in Florida in his early 70s, who was a first-year high school teacher when the show aired, and his website was a love letter to the show. So I called him up, and he was raving about the show. He said, yeah, I have most of the episodes, and this is incredible. So I sat there, and I went, you know what? I have to write this book. I have to make people aware of this classic show, which unfortunately is the one that slipped away. So I have, the book's getting great reviews, and uh, Warner Archive has made noise that they are going to issue the first season of Mr. Novak on a DVD set, hopefully sometime later this year. So I, in a way, I've kind of brought it back, which makes me feel great, because more and more people are being aware of it, and I've done a lot of podcasts or interviews, and now I'm Skyping for the first time. And uh, it's just a great show, but it blew me away. That's why I did the book. And I devoted three years to it, and here it is. Now, I watched the episodes you sent me on DVD, and I have to admit, I was drawn in. The acting is solid, as are the scripts. But there's even more to it than that. Um, I loved the starkness. Uh, from the black and white. I mean, the, the fact that they were in black and white and not color, that starkness sort of added an element of realism to the whole thing. Well, it, it's, it's funny you should bring that up. Here's an interesting point about the production of the Mr. Novak series. Just about everybody's gone who were regulars and so forth. We'll talk about that a little later. But I did find one technician, Bob Schultz, who was the property master on the show. So he was there every day for both seasons filming. And great guy, honest, too. So we did a long interview, and he told me that in 1963, when the show started in production, it was filmed at MGM, which is in Culver City, near here, me, in California. And at that time, MGM wasn't making many new features. They would rent studio space, or they would uh, pick up other features for distribution. So all of the A-list technicians, motion picture technicians, were on salary and had to be put to work. So in Mr. Novak, 
camera, set design, lighting, sound, makeup, costumes, everything is A-list motion picture technicians. And it shows. And, and speaking of that technical quality, I mean, they the technical side of it all was, it, it's fascinating to know that the first episode, if I'm not mistaken, shot at a real high school, but then subsequent episodes, they kind of basically redesigned most of the high school on the MGM lot. They built, like, their own school, not a whole building, but actual sets to mimic what they did. A- am I correct in that? Well, it is, and and they they filmed the pilot at a, a high school here in Silver Lake, which is near, you know, Suburbville, and uh, they shot it during the Christmas vacation of 1962. So all the kids in the pilot are all actual students, many of whom later became extras on the show. So they duplicated the classrooms and corridors on the MGM lot, but exterior filming throughout the two-year run was shot at John Marshall High School or Hamilton High School, which is here in Culver City. So again, a degree of, little more degree of realism. One of the things I loved also about watching those episodes you sent me is that, and it's kind of a sad reality, is that many of the themes and ideas we saw in those episodes, or I saw, are prevalent still today, whether it's racism, alcoholism, uh, school dropouts and such. Um, you know, in particular, I'm thinking about the, the episode, The Tender Twigs, that while, yeah, it was also dealing with the, the far right and, and their insanity and such, it also addresses the issue of schools under attack for what they teach, which we still see to this day. Um, were there ever any episodes that met with resistance with the network? Cause I know the NBC network could, be as with other TV shows like Star Trek and stuff, resistant to, you know, anything too thought provoking? Well, not really. And the quality of what you're talking about and the eternal theme of the shows that still hold up or were cutting edge or even now cutting edge is down to E. Jack Newman. Now, E. Jack Newman was the creator of the show, uh, executive producer. It was his baby. And he had had a long and respected career in radio and television. He wrote a great Twilight Zone episode called The Trouble with Templeton. He had uh, developed Dr. Kildare. He was a, a guy who went the extra mile for integrity and quality. And he wanted to bring the realistic high school experience, as much as TV could do in those days, to the screen. And he was so respected by NBC, they kind of let everything go, and all these cutting-edge shows came in. Now, the one time he didn't, and, and let me tell you about this, because this was a missed opportunity. In the summer of 64, between the two seasons, he was reading articles that VD was running rampant among teenagers, because the 60s are happening now. It's 1964. You know what I mean? We're moving it, new permissiveness, and this and that. And kids are having sex and getting VD, but aren't talking to their parents or getting treatment. So he developed a two-part crossover script in which in the first show, which would have been Mr. Novak, a boy tries to commit suicide because he's found he has a venereal disease, and he's a student at Jefferson High School. Part two would have been on Dr. Kildare where he's shown to be access, you know, treated and talk to your parents and deal with it and everything. And it has a very downbeat ending where he has to tell his little cute girlfriend that he slept with someone else and she dumps him. So it's a very hard-hitting episode. Well, anyway, NBC was reluctant, but they pretty much green-lighted it, which would have been great because Newman's point was you could show a documentary at 10 o'clock at night but the kids aren't watching that. The kids are watching Mr. Novak or Dr. Kildare because they're on at earlier time slots and they both had attractive leading men, right? So, But at the last minute, they bailed. And they said, no, because it's going to discuss sex during the 7.30 time slot. We can't have that. Now, I have the scripts, and in the book, I have plot synopses, and there was nothing objection. They were just frightened. Now, if you brought up Room 222, that's about five years later. Now it's the late 60s. Yeah, BD is mentioned. So it, it's a missed opportunity, but it does show that E. Jack Newman was trying to use the platform of Mr. Novak to 
mention social conditions or anything. And a lot of the episodes do hold up. <clears throat> There's one on anti-Semitism that was so well received that B'nai Brith wanted Prince to show at their meetings. There's another episode about dropouts that was wanted to be shown in prisons or high schools. 16 millimeter prints were requested to educate the kids from a network TV show? What? Yes, that's how influential it was. And that was something else, too. Series star James Franciscus really had strong opinions on education. Uh, he went on to write a series of columns about it. Was it the show's reality that brought all that about in him? Yeah, I would think so. <clears throat> James Franciscus was a what, up and coming solid professional actor. He'd been on Naked City for a year, a few years before, and he guest starred on a lot of shows. But that was a perfect case of actor and role linking up. And he had been a journalism and theater major at Yale. So when he played Mr. Novak, he got both. So he wrote a regular advice column for a, uh, when I say teen magazine, I don't mean like a pop star magazine. It was a magazine for young women to, you know, grow and that kind of thing. But he actually wrote advice columns for kids. You know, don't cheat. Uh, see the movie, but read the book. Uh, do social uh, work and help in your neighborhood, that kind of thing. And he actually wrote them, and many of the kids read them, and he was using his stardom to educate his audience, which, again, is a very noble thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Now, something else I also liked about the series, though, was, you know, n not everything was what it would appear to be. Um, that episode you mentioned, The Risk, uh, right. One of the things I loved about it was that from the beginning you thought maybe you'd learn in the end that the teacher that Franciscus's character, Mr. Novak, stands up for and helps him get a job might actually be the one with the drinking problem. And it turns out that it's his actually much younger wife, played right. by Sherry Jackson, who did yes. a fantastic job. And in fact, uh, I interviewed Sherry for the book, and she said that was her first adult part where she plays uh, a younger alcoholic wife and shows up drunk at the school, and she underplays it, and she's very good. And Alexander Scorby in the episode has uh, a scene where he's teaching a class, and he reads from the Raven about the lost Lenore, and it's an allegory for his previous wife. And he's just wonderful. But like I said, John, that, that was the first full episode I saw after the pilot, and I was blown away. And what's amazing about Mr. Novak is whenever there's sentiment, Sometimes it's an unhappy ending, or there's a sad scene, or whatever. It's never maudlin, and it's no. still genuinely moving. And I contacted over 40 actors who appeared on the show, and every single one of them, except one or two for various reasons, the minute I mentioned Mr. Novak, absolutely, 50 years later, I love being on that show, it was an excellent show, can you send me my D DVDs and my episodes? So I did, and every single one of them, got back to me, oh my God, this show holds up great. They showed them to their kids and grandkids. And even though it's an old black and white show, they didn't think it was old or boring or stupid or anything. And what's funny, if they had granddaughters who were teenagers, they saw James Franciscus and went, oh, he's a hottie. So he <laughs> will forever be a hottie. Right. No, but it's really nice because anybody I've sent them to, and you're another one, when you saw them, wow. OK, and this is the show that never reran. This is the one great series from the 60s that didn't rerun in the 70s, didn't come out on VHS in the 80s, didn't come out on DVD in the 90s and isn't streaming now. This is the one that got away. So hopefully it'll come back and get the recognition it deserves. And I know once Warner Archive gets it together, People are going to wake up and go, oh, my God, this this is this ranks with the Twilight Zone, the Dick Van Dyke show, the, the greatest shows of the 60s and among the greatest dramatic shows in the history of television. Now, now, speaking of that, though, you said that it didn't get a rerun, although it, it did have a brief run on TNT. Now, how did that come about? Well, what happened was the show ended and had 60 episodes. And if you think about it, look what show. TV was in those days. You produce 31 hours of content a year. Nowadays, if you do 10 episodes, maybe, you know, it's a different thing. But anyway, they only had 60. 
And in those days, in the 60s, they wanted 90 episodes. They wanted at least three seasons because they had to run five, five times a week. The other thing was James Franciscus and Dean Jagger, who were the two leads, worked for deferred salaries on the show and a higher royalty rate for the reruns. So it was an expensive show that was also not enough episodes. The demand was there, okay? And uh, although it didn't happen, E. Jack Newman received requests from major school boards wanting to get 16 millimeter prints of the 10 best of each season and show them in classes to educate. It didn't happen, but that was the respect for the show. So in the mid 80s, Ted Turner bought the MGM lot and he owned everything. And so he owned all the content filmed at MGM. So when he started Turner Network Television, to fill the three to four o'clock in the morning time slot, he reran Mr. Novak episodes. And fortunately, TV fans set their VCRs, because I've got 55 of the 60, and there's hardly any bad ones. Their batting average is a solid A, if you want to do the, the teacher grade. <laughs> really good. Really, really good. Now, one person who stood out to me in all this was uh, Jean Ball, I think you pronounce her name? Jeannie Ball. Jeannie Ball, okay. Uh, she plays the assistant principal. Now, uh, long before Star Trek tried with its pilot uh, episode of having a female first officer, here was a woman, a second in command of a school, and her portrayal was solid. She was not there to hold hands. She was not there to, to be the motherly type. And, and in the episodes I saw, uh, she wasn't talked down to by any of the men. Now, no, was, you're was this yeah, a conscious decision on the producer's part? Yes, it was, and uh, uh, she started on the show in some smaller roles, and they wanted to have um, an attractive assistant principal instead of a mom type, you know, that showed an attractive woman could still be a woman of authority, which was really groundbreaking in those days, you know, and uh, at some point in the first season, Dean Jagger had an attack of ulcers and had to drop out for a little bit. So she got his lines and her parts started to be built up. So for the rest of the season, she got more and more to do. And she was a huge favorite. And the thing that uh, uh, is amazing about this show is it won a total of 47 awards in the two years. Most from educational institutions, E. Jack Newman, NBC, The Show, Dean Jagger, James Franciscus, Jeannie Ball, Burgess Meredith, who came along later. Everybody won awards, uh, writing awards. It just astounding. So the plan for the second season was to make Jeannie Ball the third lead. But she butted heads with a new producer who came in who kind of changed things some. And it was a yes, I will, no, you won't. Nobody wanted to back down, and she dropped out of the show, which was a real blow against it. Because in network television, if you lose a lead or two, you're in real trouble. You know, it because audience identification or that kind of thing. So it was unfortunate, but she's great. She really is. Yeah. And and uh, the one cast member who's still living was Marion Collier who played uh, Miss Scott, the home ec teacher. And it turned out she married E. Jack Newman five years after the show, so she had his full archive, which he opened to me. So talk about double jackpot. You're right. She was telling me everybody on that show worked harder, were more into it, showed up early, stayed late, because they knew they had something that made a difference. And when the awards started coming in again and again and again and again, they just... they felt like they were making a difference and they did and in those days many young people became teachers because of that show or james franciscus dean jagger was given an honorary lifetime membership in the secondary principles of america association i mean you name it in, in the book there's a whole list of all the awards they won and it's very impressive again for a show that's forgotten this is a prestige show all the way all right. Now, there's something, too, I just really want to also point out for uh, fans of Star Trek, since I brought up Star Trek, Jeannie Ball, to Star Trek fans, will probably be best remembered as Nancy Carter in right. the very first episode that did air, um, The Man Trap. That's right. Yeah. As soon as I saw her face, I was like, I know who she is. 
<laughs> well, here's the other Star Trek connection. <clears throat> Walter Koenig, who wrote the afterword for the book and has become a dear friend, and he's a real sweet guy. Um, his first lead on an episode of network television was on Mr. Novak in the first season. He played Alexei Dubov, a Russian exchange student who came to Jefferson High and had trouble filling in. He's great, really good. Well, he told me four years later, the producers on Star Trek wanted to add a sexy young member to the Enterprise, so, someone like uh, Davy Jones of the Monkeys. Yeah, cute, that guy. Well, it turned out that the same casting director was on Mr. Novak as Star Trek. Well, I know the guy, yeah, can you do a Russian accent? Well, here's some film, boom, and it got him Chekhov. And he actually did three episodes of uh, Mr. Novak. But it's so funny, when I called him to talk about this, and I mentioned Mr. Novak, he said, absolutely, oh my God, that show was great, blah, 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 blah. Can I see the episodes? Unbelievable. Everybody went crazy. Tony Dow is another guy. He was on five episodes. I contacted him. Oh, absolutely, great show, great show. So I sent him the DVDs to watch, and when I went to interview him, he had watched all ten, even five he wasn't even in. And he has been a director, and he was going on about, God, this show holds up. It could be redone today. And again, just all, all praise all the way. Unbelievable. You had, uh, you said Walter Koenig doing the uh, concluding comments, and you also had um, uh, Martin Mark Landau Mike. doing the introduction. Yeah, and and that, that was bittersweet. I mean, I contacted him. And he said, absolutely. E. Jack Newman was a creator of the highest caliber. Please, can you send me the episode? So I sent him, and, and he did an interview, and he said, there's nothing dated about these episodes. They're wonderful. And it's funny, his second episode is really prophetic, a 1965 episode near the end. And he plays the aggressive salesman of this new device for high school called a teaching machine. <laughs> it's a printed computer. So he comes in and he's saying, this can do the job quicker, faster than any human teacher. And, you know, you need to buy it, this and that. And Nehemiah Persoff, a great character actor, plays a teacher who says, no, you've got to have the human touch, too. And they sort of argue the point back and forth. But here we go again, Mr. Novak. And nowadays, I don't know how it is in your high school, but I would imagine computers at least partially teach. You know, so, so that, right. Yeah. So that was prophetic, you know, and here we go again. And when he saw that episode, he went crazy, he called me up, called me Lad. And he says, Lad, Lad, oh, computers, that's amazing, you know. And so I said, would you write the foreword for the book? He says, oh, absolutely. And I was just about to deliver him one, and I called, and he died the day before. So... That was a drag, but he knew about it. He was happy for me. He says, oh, I hope you sell them, and I hope the show comes back, and E. Jack Newman. James Franciscus was a total professional. Dean Jagger was great. He couldn't have been nicer. The, the scenes with, with uh, Martin Landau and uh, James Franciscus in the um, episode you sent me, uh, I think it's called Just Pay the $2. Yeah. Uh, fa fant and, and again, Jeannie Ball also gets to shine in that because... Yeah. Uh, 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 Dean Jager wasn't available for that, I guess. Right. That was one of the ones where Dean was sick. Yeah. And, uh, but again, as I started getting them, John, you know, because I had some and then the guy in Florida sent some and I, you know, getting them here, getting them there. Marion, uh, E. Jack Newman's widow had some. I just kept watching them and I'm going, great, great. One or two bad ones, but you're going to get that in network television. But most of them just, I can't believe it. Just, Good after good after good after good after good. Amazing. I mean, they had a couple on racial prejudice, which are really cutting edge. I mean, could hold up now. And this is in 1963, the year that Martin Luther King made the speech at the uh, Lincoln Memorial. Right on the pulse of the modern times. And that was E. Jack Newman. He wanted his school to be diverse. And here's another interesting thing. One of the teachers was played by an African-American actor named Vince Howard. Yes. And, okay, and now he had previously been a singer. He hadn't acted, but E. Jack Newman saw him in a club and said, hey, you want to act on a new show? And, yeah, okay. <laughs> so they brought him in, and he's one of the faculty. Now, this is 1963, 
two years before Bill Cosby on I Spy. So the real first African-American actor to be a regular on a network dramatic show was Vince Howard. Okay, and, and so here we go again, E. Jack Newman. And that's why in the second season, when he sort of stepped down a little and another producer came in, it was still very good, but it got a little wobbly. You know, and, and I think it was just a case of exhaustion because he put in six days a week, you know, 14 hours a day, and it just, you know, it, it was that or drop. Right. Part of, you know, like Rod Sterling pretty much almost killed himself on his series, you know, from the, the work uh, mode. But that's what's so amazing, you know, and uh, I, I, I don't know. I've had so much fun doing this because everybody I've talked to, I mean, I interviewed people who were extras on the show, and and there's one lady, a uh, quick story, and this, again, about how TV was in those days prior to VCRs and so forth, but there's a lady then named Lori Georges, now Lori Georges Gonzalez, who lives in Texas, you know, sweetheart, forever 16. And she told me that she was in the pilot, and she had a huge crush on James Franciscus, like every other teenage girl in America. And she was an extra occasionally on the show. Now, in those days of one TV set families, and remember, it was opposite combat, several of her girlfriends were crying the blues because they couldn't watch Mr. Novak because Dad wanted to watch combat. <laughs> Lori's dad worked nights. So she said, Mom, can I have the girls over for Novak nights if I get my chores done? Well, okay. So for the whole two-year run of the show, every Tuesday night, there'd be 10, 15, eventually 20 teenage girls all crowded into her living room to watch the show, to ooh and ah, and, and you know, loved it. And that's something about the beauty of, of teenagers' love of a performer at a show. You know, and I thought, well, that's charming, and she loved it, and she's in it, and she calls herself Laurie the Extra now. So, <laughs> yeah, sweetheart. You know, again, when I sent the shows to her, same thing, seeing them again. Oh my God, I can't believe how good this is. She showed them to her kids, and her kids' kids, all batted a thousand. You know, it's funny you you, you bring that up about the. Um you know, I'll do my chores. And I think about how, what a shame it is these days with television that because of the instantness of it, you know, Netflix and there's on demand and we can DVR, we could be, you know, you, there was a certain thing of like, you want to watch Mr. Novak, you got to see it at this time and you've got to behave a certain way. I was the same way in the seventies with right. the six million dollar man and the bionic woman. There you go. And, and that, and that's, Nice, you know, and I've talked to a couple other extras on. Again, loved the show. Everybody was cool. Uh, it just, no one has said anything bad about it. I don't mean to paint it's like saintly or anything, but, you know, just unbelievable. And again, John, this is the one that disappeared. Yeah. It's like the Mona Lisa disappeared from the Louvre, you know, and, but, but it's not, gone they exist you know so it, it should be really something to see when it comes back and it influenced room 222 uh heavily and then down the years you know the paper chase in the 80s which is more college and so forth you know the series have gone down but prior to mr novak the two series about high schools were our miss brooks and mr peepers which were <laughs> yes. sitcoms no they were good sitcoms they were good sitcoms but, but they were sitcoms they were silly silly silly, silly, silly. Yeah. And that's what E. Jack Newman wanted to do, is to show the, as, as real as he could on TV in those days, the high school experience and how it, um, you know, really, um, really was. And it woke up a lot of people. Uh, a lot of students loved that show and would write about it in the high school newspapers and they would have discussions and it really incredibly influential. Now, the show had a number of great guest stars. I was I was floored in just even the sampling you sent me, and then of course you know you you list them in the book as well. Right. Um, you know either they were students or they were teachers, or in some cases like the the episode I mentioned that I enjoyed so much, Robert Culp, people from yeah. outside the school interacting right. with the school and such. Who stood out to you among the guest stars? Oh wow! Uh, well. <laughs> All of them, but uh, 
No, Robert Culp's great. I missed him by a year, which is, I'm sorry, but uh, but he's a really right-wing extremist monster. Yeah. He's great. And uh, just about any of them, really, you know, uh, and although she's not that known, bringing up guest stars, another great story. Near the end of the book, I was going through and I was going to, uh, along with the vintage reviews, because the book has vintage reviews of every episode, I wanted to grade them myself. So I'm the teacher. I rated them B plus, C minus, you know, with a school thing in mind. Right. So I was looking at them, and near the end, there was an episode that had a young African-American girl in it who was just great. And I thought, God, she must be 14. Allison Mills. I, hmm, I, did I try and reach her? So I looked back through my notes, and I didn't. So I snooped around, and I found her. She's Allison Mills Newman. She lives in Atlanta. She's a minister, and she also makes uh, indie films. She had a very successful one a few years ago. So I finally got her on the phone. Now, remember, it's 52 years later. Uh, hi, Alice. Oh, hi. Uh, I want to talk to you about Mr. Novak. <gasps> Mr. Novak was the most greatest. Of the, you know, same thing. So I sent her the episode, and uh, here's her backstory. At that time, she was part of a black acting theater troupe in L.A., and she was 14. She hadn't done any TV work because there wasn't any roles on TV for black people in those days. Right. But she did a little theater. Now, a character actor named Frank Silvera, black guy, had done a Novak, and he was contacted. We've got a, sh a show coming up. We need a teenage girl. It's called Where, Do you, what, Where Is There to Go Billy But Up? She's a Billy Holiday fan. Okay, well, I also went down, auditioned, and got the part. So she was thrilled. She's 14. So all excited and everything. So she went to the first day's filming with her mom, and Lois Nettleton, a fine character actress, acts with her. And this is the first time she's ever even stepped foot on a TV lot. Lois hugged her, was nice, told her she was beautiful. She did her big scene. Crew applauded, gave her flowers. James Franciscus came over and talked to her mother and said, you've got a fine young actress here. I mean, it couldn't have been a more beautiful first time thing. So about three, four weeks later, the show aired and all 35, 40 members of the acting troupe were all crowded into Allison's living room because remember, you gotta catch it when you see it and to watch it. And they all hugged her and cried and oh my God, it was incredible. Well, that led to parts, and she ended up being a semi-regular on the Julia TV series with Diane Carroll as a babysitter, and then did some acting, and then sort of drifted into religion and so forth. But she's telling me this, and when she called me the first time, she ends up crying and praised the Lord, and her daughter gets on, and her daughter's crying, and I'm crying, and it was wonderful. It really was. The love of the whole thing. It really was. I find it so remarkable, though, because in the book you tell how you got those DVDs back in 2015, and here we are three years later, and this show has really affected you. Well, yeah, it has. I mean, I've written books before. Right. This, I think the best one I've done, and I, I'm a slam dunk for good reviews. I think I have 34 or five-star reviews on Amazon, and, you know, nice, nice you know, and... and uh, I worked real hard on it. You know, it was a labor of love, certainly. But again, I, I just, the rub of it all, John, throughout was I keep seeing all this greatness in front of me for a show that's been forgotten and disappeared. You know, and I felt like the Lone Ranger or something that I, I've got to somehow do something about it. You know, uh, so it, it's been a really great ride, man. I, uh, I just, even now, you know, occasionally, you know, I'll get another email or somebody, hey, I picked the book up, wow, it's awesome, or I had no idea, or, you know, when's it coming out, you know, and everything. And Home Theater Forum is a, a big website about shows that should be on DVD, and there's all kinds of posts there, you know. I think like 10,000 people have, have looked at the Mr. Novak post, so hopefully that's telling Warner Archive, uh, dude, you're going to sell some, so, you know, get with it. So it's really been a joy. And how funny. What if I'd have packed them away that night and watched them? Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know? Wow. So it, like you, like everyone else, when I saw them, I freaked out and said, oh, my God, this show is great. What's going on here? 
because I knew James Franciscus primarily from the Longstreet series, uh, and then maybe uh, Beneath the Planet of the Apes and Maroon. That's right. You know, or he, he did a couple of, uh, a lot of TV movies. So I knew him, you know, handsome guy, solid actor, and I knew him from Naked City, but he's real good in this. And in fact, you being a teacher might appreciate this. At the end of the first season, E. Jack Newman prepared a 16 millimeter film to be distributed to high schools or future teacher of America meetings. And in it, he took clips from the first season of Mr. Novak that showed Mr. Novak's evolution as a teacher, how he's awkward, gets more confidence and everything, and worked it into a little short, and Newman posted it holding the Peabody Award. And so great was the demand that they struck over a hundred prints or more. Again, this is a TV series, but look at the influence. And I'm sure seeing that film made young people want to become teachers or future teachers of America meetings or just teachers in general. Oh, I see. And that's what was good about the scripting because you see Franciscus grow. He gets more confident. He's able to handle things better. Where at first he's a little over his head, you know, but he gets better. And that's real life. That is real life. And I, and I did notice that too. But one thing I also did love about the character of Mr. Novak is that, and it wasn't arrogance. It was when he's right about something, he's right. Whether it was in, um, you know, just pay the two dollars or, or, uh, the, the, uh, and now I'm blanking on the other episode uh, that I, that I, I said I love so much. I just blanked on the title. Um, <laughs> The, the Tender Twigs. Tender Twigs. Yeah. Yeah. Both of, both of those, well, he did not back down. No, no. It, no. it would have and been easy a little, to. A little later in his career, and again, that's what's so nice. And we haven't talked much about Dean Jagger, but Dean Jagger is wonderful in this show. He yes. may be the best thing about it, because he, he plays a principle of authority, but with a little confusion. And... He's unsure of things, and his, his dialogue delivery sometimes is throwaway dialogue, which is way more realistic. And uh, he's a confident man, but he's human. And he's a fair man, but he's firm. And uh, the teacher in Florida, who uh, is still teaching, said when he was teaching, when Mr. Novak was on, many of his fellow teachers wished they'd had a principal like Principal Vane from the show, because he was just just a real man of integrity. And there are scenes with Dean Jagger, sometimes with Franciscus or Jeannie Ball or anybody else, where it's so realistic how they relate to each other. Sometimes it's just little muttered asides that carry a load of, of emotional import. And that's, again, when I'm seeing some of these, sometimes it's not a happy ending. The juvenile delinquent can't come back to school or the boy's parents basically disown him or whatever, or a pregnant girl has to leave or whatever it is, where you'd think seeing it now, all this time later, it would be overdone and obvious, which a lot of shows are, isn't. And, and I've even given episodes to a few friends of mine, who aren't particularly into 60s. Uh, it's kind of funny, but I have this drummer friend in New York. He's not into it at all, but he's my friend. So, hey, send me some episodes. So I did. He called me up and he was mad at me. He says, I'm mad at you. And I go, why? He says, I, I cried last night at the end of the episode. <laughs> Meaning it affected him. Okay? Right. Now, what does that say about a piece of art that still is moving? Oh, yeah. It's great. Yeah. You know? And, and I loved that you included in the book um, uh, Principal Vane's uh, speech his whole thing at the beginning from the very first episode. Yeah, that's in there. And in the appendix, there's there's a couple of real cool things. Um, I've got the plot synopses of the DD episodes. So you can see what it could have been. There's uh, a list of the awards. There's an amazing 12-page guide by E. Jack Newman to future writers of Mr. Novak, where he goes into biographical detail about the characters to a really nth degree. And I have friends here in Hollywood who are aspiring screenwriters, and I've shown it to them, and they've gone crazy. Wow, what a great idea, you know, if you're coming in to write for something, rather than a superficial, well, he's a young teacher, and he uh, lives in an apartment or whatever. There's really a background. So, with, again, the writing on Mr. Novak is great for many reasons, but one of them was 
They knew who they were writing for. They knew who the characters were. And again, that that really shows it. And then there's Dean Jagger's speech from, uh, you know, the pilot where he's telling new teachers, you know, be firm, but don't be friends with them and so forth. And it's funny, John. I mean, I can see in the background there you're a Batman guy. So <laughs> that Batman had a ton of memorabilia, as many 60s shows did. Mr. Novak strangely didn't. The only memorabilia was a Monopoly-type board game, which is fun, where you get to be student body president or whatever. There was a, an album of uh, soundtrack stuff uh, from the show, and that's it. You know, I thought, how weird. I thought, for sure, writing tablets, pencils. You know, I don't know why. I couldn't find out why. I don't know why. Weird. Yeah, that would that would make uh, a great deal of sense, having notebooks or what have you yeah, with Mr. Novak on it. I don't know why I couldn't find out an answer, but still the game the game's there and it's cool. So. Yeah, you even actually include the rules to the game in the book as well. I, I'm, I'm curious about that because the book has a number of elements um, and, and it's incredibly detailed for for what was a two year show. I mean, was there anything that you had to leave out for one reason or another? Uh, I don't think so. Um, what I, what I did in the book, and a lot of people seem to like, is, um, well, let me say this. Uh, I have a lot of books, you know, in, uh, about television shows or, or movies or whatever. Right. And sometimes you can get authors that want to cram every little bit of minutia into a book. And it's so overwhelming, it's not readable. And after a while, you kind of blank and start flipping pages. I deliberately structured this to be more conversational and light. So I got the info in, but I made it flow lightly. Right. And a lot of people seem to like that. It does. It holds, it holds the interest. You oh, know, yeah. it's jam-packed with stuff. Um, no, I don't think so. I mean, uh, I, I, I thought since Mr. Novak is not an action show, it is a television show, and television shows are part of a visual medium. So I've got, like, I don't know, 300 photos in or illustrations. There's a lot of pictures in it, and I wanted to you to be able to kind of see it because remember unless you knew where to go if you get the book you're reading about a show that hasn't aired so you've got to kind of see it through the book and several of the reviews have said you know god it's just like watching it i can't wait to watch the real thing you know that kind of thing. <laughs> and what could be more gratifying to me so it made me very happy you know. now, and one thing i loved also about the book uh because a lot of these books, a lot of times when you see these show, books about shows, TV shows that are retrospectives or what have you, is that they may have some pictures, but not a lot. You managed to acquire quite a collection I, of images, um, and not, not just the stars. I loved all the advertisements that you included uh, well, for, for episode-specific advertisements. Yeah, yeah, well, that's what I wanted to do. And, and fortunately, these days, because it didn't used to be that way, there are vintage newspaper sites online, and I belong to four. So you can pick a subject and go. Newspapers.com is a great one if yes. you're ever interested. Look up Batman. You'll find all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I've, I've been to newspapers.com. Okay. okay. Well, that is. So I kept finding reviews, ads, articles, uh, sometimes a caricature drawing or, you know, whatever. And I just really wanted to make this show as appealing as I could in the book in the hopes that anybody who reads the book or goes to the website, which, by the way, is MrNovakBook.com, M-R-N-O-V-A-K-B-O-O-K.com, and a lot of content, and there's very nice endorsement videos from Ed Asner, uh, Tony Dow, and Walter Koenig, you know, and, and some other great stuff. But I just wanted to make it so appealing that people would want to seek it out or talk about it or think about it or something, you know, and I, I succeeded, so I'm very happy about that. Now, I'm starting to run out of time here, but okay. Chuck, I gotta, I gotta ask you this, if they, they're gonna be releasing the first season of the DVD, I haven't watched all the episodes, you sent me a random sampling over the two seasons yeah. and such, but I want to introduce the show to somebody else, and this is something I always ask of any of the old-time TV shows that I, I uh, talk about with fans and friends and such. What would you suggest would be the, the, the starting point? I know that sounds weird because you think a show about a school, maybe it's the first episode, but is there another episode, or, or is it the first one you should start with to get the Yeah, I, I, I would say if, if you're going to hip anybody to it, John, is 
the DVD that has first year, first day, followed by the risk. That's the beginning show where the character is introduced, and then the risk is just a great, one really show. And and again, uh, those are the two I saw the first time, where I went <gasps> that made me go on this journey. And I, in some cases, uh, either for people or potential reviewers or whatever, well, just send me two episodes, and I just send that one disc. They watch them both, they go crazy. <laughs> so I would say first year, first day, and um, um, the rest are really good ones. Really good. Okay. All right. Now, Chuck Harder, you've got this book out here. What's next for you? What are you working well, on? Well, I am working on something. It, it's a more modest project, but, um, again, it kind of happened in the same way that Mr. Novak did. I will be partnering with a, a, an author named Martin Grams, Jr., he lives in the Baltimore area. He did a great book uh, on the Twilight Zone. He's written a lot of books on radio and TV. Yeah, he's a very nice man. I, I know Martin. Yeah, Martin's a good pal, and so we're going to self-publish, which will be interesting because I haven't done that before, so it's a learning thing. But I'm somewhat of a fan of the old horror TV shows and films, and uh, many, many years ago, somebody said, well, here's a videotape of an old show called Way Out. Well, what was that? And they said, oh, it was a show in 1961, kind of like the Twilight Zone. Well, okay. But the tape was such bad quality, I couldn't even look at it. It was like ninth generation. So anyway, about seven, eight months ago, Martin sends me some DVDs in the mail. And I look at it, and it's ten episodes of Way Out that have appeared suddenly on YouTube out of the 14. There were 14 episodes. I watched them. I was blown away. So I called him sometimes later. Hey, Martin, let's do a, a little book on Way Out. Yeah, okay. Now, Way Out's an interesting show. In January of 61, Jackie Gleason returned to television in a game show called You're in the Picture. Now, think of this for a concept. I don't know. Unbelievable. It was a, a big panel with four holes, and celebrities would stick their heads through and there'd be a funny body drawn underneath them, like <laughs> Arthur Fisher would have a bikini girl under him or something like that. They had to talk to Gleason to figure out who was under him. One episode laid the biggest egg in the history of television. Garbage. Worst. It, it, horrible. The next week in the time slot, Gleason went on with a cup of <clears throat> coffee. Yes. And, and he basically apologized for the show. The critics went nuts. It was the funniest thing they'd ever seen, so they dumped the show, and so for the next six, seven weeks, in the time slot, he'd just sit there and talk to somebody or whatever, okay? So he had to go to France to shoot Gigo, which is a film he was doing, so the network contacted David Suskind of Talent Associates. Suskind had produced Open End and was a respected television producer. Can you whip up something on a horror show? Uh, something like The Twilight Zone. Well, yeah, okay. So he contacted the British writer Roald Dahl, Ooh. Willie Fame, right. and who, who hosts the show. He's the Rod Serling or Alfred Hitchcock on the show, and he's great. He's real creepy. <clears throat> so they contacted for 14 episodes. It was the last, I would say, network series shot live in New York City in the summer of 61. So it was taped live and then pre-recorded and shown the next day. It aired on Friday nights right before the Twilight Zone. So on the YouTube clips on Way Out, at the end, you can hear Rod Serling saying, and stay tuned for the Twilight Zone where, you know, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, I watched the 10. There's one bad one, but most of them are pretty good. And some of them are genuinely still scary. The makeup artist on the show was Dick Smith, who later became an Academy Award winner. He did The Exorcist and all that kind of thing. And uh, so I started doing some research here and there, and we've got some, you know, pretty good. It won't be certainly on the Novak level, because it was a brief show. Right. I think it'll be pretty good, you know. And, I, and the fact that 10 of them are now available on YouTube means you can see them. And if you have a chance, um, False Face or... Sideshow, try try it with those, okay. and uh, it's pretty good. 
and all 14 exist. The other four episodes are at the Paley Center for TV here in Beverly Hills, so I've seen all 14. And so this will be a book about it. Um, I've already got a fair amount of good material, and uh, that's the next sort of little mini project, you might say. But in the shows of the, that time, you've got The Twilight Zone, Alfred Hitchcock, Thriller, The Outer Limits, One Step Beyond. All are available, all have books on them. Much like Novak, Way Out's the little one that slipped under the crack. It's sort of like a junior cousin of the Twilight Zone. And so that'll be the next one. And, and I tell you, like Martin, you're going to have a, a winner there because Martin writes some fantastic books. Yeah, well, we, we respect each other and uh, he helped a lot on Mr. Novak. So I think we're going to, when I say knock it out, I mean in the sense we'll have it done in four months because we want to debut it in September at his Mid-Atlantic Nostalgia Convention in Baltimore. But it'll be good. You know, and, and again, here's a show. I think when people start to read about it or they watch a few, they're going to go, whoa, oh, the other one, you know. <laughs> so, and it is, it is pretty good, you know, pretty scary. And it's funny, Way Out was controversial at the time because in the mid part of the country, it was on at 8.30 at night instead of 9.30. So some mothers were complaining it was too scary. Hmm. And some critics said, well, the Twilight Zone's scary, but it tells moral lessons. Way Out is just frightening. But isn't that the point? It's a scary show. And, and a couple of program directors actually jerked episodes off the air for being too frightening, which is kind of quaint when you see them now, because they're not, but they're, you know, but they are pretty good. Right, right. So that'll be the next one, Way Out. I've gone from high school to being Way Out. <laughs> now, Chuck, um, how can people reach you if they want to discuss Mr. Novak or the upcoming publication of Way Out? Well, um, if you go to MrNovakBook.com, N-R, sorry, M-R-N-O-V-A-K-B-O-O-K.com, MrNovakBook.com, there is a place in there where you can uh, Google email me, you know, and I check them and I can get back to you. Very cool, very cool. Chuck Harder, thank you so much for sitting down with me this morning here on The Chronic Rift and talking about Mr. Novak. I, you know... I, le I learned something in watching the show. Well, what does that tell you? 50 years later. Yeah. You know what I mean? So um, Mr. Novak endures, and hopefully when Warner gets it together, uh, it'll endure even more. And, uh, you know, anybody that, that sees me or hears this, you know, if you <coughs> snoop around the Internet, you can find copies. <laughs> uh, yeah, you can. But it's worth seeing. It really is. And uh, it's just, I'm not knocking current TV per se, but different times. You know what I mean? And, and Mr. Novak captured that early 60s Kennedy era New Frontier idealism. And it, it, it's just wonderful to behold. Different times, but I'll maintain that a lot of the themes and ideas are still just as relevant today. Oh, no, absolutely. I meant more in the sense that I think a lot of television programming now, uh, perhaps the bean counters have more of a input than they did then, mm -hmm. you know? Right. So it's fine. And there are great new shows. I mean, you can't say, you know, nothing's good. No, absolutely. There will always be great shows. But there was something about the early 60s when it was just coming out of the repressed Eisenhower era. Kennedy's in the White House. Everything seemed possible. There were a slew of good shows, The Defenders, East Side, West Side, or Comedy, Andy Griffith, Dick Van Dyke. Um, it, it just, everybody was really cooking at that time. You know, and this is before any of the cynicism of the late 60s came in, when we had assassinations and Vietnam and all that kind of thing. So, Mr. Novak is not an, ideally, an idealized look at that time, as it is a wonderful capture of that glory of America of that time. And uh, it really is good to see. I, I never thought I'd go back to high school for three years, but I have. And I, I too, learned a lot, John. So there you go. I think I got a, hopefully an A+. <laughs> I, I, I could say definitely reading the book, watching the show, definitely have an A-plus there, Chuck. 
All right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, folks, I'm going to take a quick break, and when I come back, I'm going to wrap up the show. Chuck, once again, thank you. Thank you, bud. Emergency. Batman speaking. Warning all of you to brace yourselves for big news. The biggest. Tell them, Robin. Holy surprises, Batman. It's really exciting. Greetings, citizens. Join me, your old bat chum, John S. Drew, on my journey to discover what it is I love about the classic 1966 Batman television series on the Batcave podcast. Each episode, I'm joined by a guest host as we review the classic television series. There's a new episode every two weeks. Same bat time, same bat channel on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, or at the batcavepodcast.com. Holy memoranda, folks. Make a note not to miss it. Good thinking, Robin. So, that's going to do it then for this episode of The Chronic Rift. Now, next week, not going to do a show. I know you're like, what? You're only 12 episodes in and you're not doing a show, but it's Easter. So I'm going to spend the day celebrating with my family, and I hope that you who celebrate spend it with yours. We'll be back in two weeks' time on April 8th, where we're going to be talking about the 50th anniversary of 2001 A Space Odyssey. I know those of you that are longtime fans of The Chronic Rift, way back in the days of the TV show, we covered this. But it was in a very short, less than 20-minute panel on what is an extraordinary movie. So we're going to devote the entire hour next week to 2001, or actually two weeks from now, 2001 A Space Odyssey. Dan Persons, our own movie critic, will join me here for this episode, as well as a couple of other people rounding out the panel. So until then, folks, thank you so much for listening. Once again, this is John saying... Take care.